Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Community Connect session, combining efforts and conducting joint advocacy activities between civil society and various government bodies. My name is Jahidul Islam. I work as the Director of Treatment and Procurement at the Alliance for Public Health in Ukraine. Today, I have with me a distinguished panel, leaders of the community who have many years of experience on advocacy and community engagement. The panel will share their experience in the preparation and implementation of advocacy campaigns and how to engage in, in the country level for advocacy. Combining efforts and conducting joint advocacy activities between civil society and various governments will be also discussed. We will further hear from the panel about lessons learned and how to build fruitful collaboration with the state authorities. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce our panel and uh, I start with uh, Christian Acosta. He is the executive director of uh, Kim Irina. Uh, and then we have Pasquin. She is uh, the executive director of um, Alive Medical uh, uh, service. And then we have Blessy Kumar, Blessina Kumar. I think Blessy needs no introduction. She is the executive director of Global Community of TB act Activists. And then Peter, Peter Wethi, he is also a community leader based in Kenya. So we have actually experience of wealth of experience from all across the world. So let's maybe hear with that, I would like to actually start maybe the presentation. And I will be the first presenter. So let me give me one second to share my screen. Okay, so basically my experience is coming in the base of Ukraine. So as I was saying, I've worked with the Alliance for Public Health. And <clears throat> as we all know, one of our uh, uh, major experience and collaboration in the country was when we were preparing for uh, 2018 UN high level meeting for uh, uh, at the UN uh, meeting. So, at the beginning, I think this was the first time UNHLM happening, especially for TB, so there were very little information. Alliance, together with the partners, and at that time, we also actually worked with a parliamentary platform, uh, which was created at that 2017, but we would, we were actually collaborating with also parliamentary platform uh, to uh, have some roundtable meeting and also a stakeholder meeting in order to make the UNHLM on the high on the agenda in the country. So having this roundtable and different kind of you know high level meeting and also at the same time collaborating with our partner NGOs and civil society from the field, we were able to actually configure a message for the government in, in order to you know sort of if ask from the country from the civil society point of view, if you will. So that was, you know, through uh, the high level uh, uh, meeting, we were able to actually pass it to the uh, government. And uh, we were also able to, due to this collaboration and actually collaboration, not only at the high level, because we had the consultation at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, regional level, also at the national level. And at the high level meeting, we were able to actually suggest or kind of influence participation from the civil society at the uh, and also parliamentary representative at the high level meeting uh, because you know we were able to input our values and uh, and our messages so that we were able to uh, suggest a civil society person to be and not only one I think we had two civil society person accompanying country delegation to the UN meeting so and due to these experiences and also engagement, I think we were able to 
built in sort of intersectional collaboration uh, during the preparation. Uh, uh, that was kind of a united effort. If we were doing all ourselves, perhaps as an organization, we would not be able to do it because we had to do it together with our partners, civil society organization, you know, uh, and also uh, people affected by tuberculosis in, in the country. We have, uh, you know, organization also uh, TB people who are really affected communities. So uh, through this collaboration, we were able to actually get that attention. And also with that, we were able to having parliamentary platform and also at the high level coordination meeting, we were able to uh, amplify the importance and the messages that we, we had. And uh, so we also actually develop a message for uh, uh, the country when the, the team was already there, there was some message, but at the same time, you know, they needed to change messages. They send information back to the country saying, oh, there are some changes. Can you give us some feedback while the sessions were happening, you know, at the same time? So we could come up with also some kind of advice during even that kind of situation, having that kind of uh, uh, collaboration and communication with the delegation who were in, in the US at that time in UN. So as a result, our uh, communities was presented, our co community, as you can see in the pictures, I think many of you would know uh, some of the people, Anton, Olya, and uh, Andre. So they're all community representative uh, from, from the country. So they were kind of there to uh, support the country delegation. And so that is the community engagement there, but coming back from the uh, UNHLM, Alliance together with the partner, we still continue to actually keep the UNHLM issues, for example, commitments that governments made during the UNHLM is still part of our agenda so that, you know, there is an accountability. For example, there is a multi-sectoral accountability framework, which was later on developed by um, uh, WHO together with the country team. So in Ukraine, we have supported also the government and country coordination mechanism to roll out multi-sectoral framework in order to get some accountability. And as, as you, we all know that UNHLM is going to happen next year. So hopefully this multi-sectoral multi -accountable, accountability framework will help formulate new messages for coming next year. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, my name is Christian and I'm part of Kimirina's team. For us, the best result in political advocacy has been to implement action directly as an organization, the same one that we executed in coordination and or with the knowledge of the Ministry of Health. This allows us to operationally demonstrate how to implement the actions and later it can be copycat in the national health system, of course, based on our results. With this, we have achieved that Ecuador has a community system for HIV and STI screening, that PrEP has been implemented as a regular offer for the key population, and we are trying to identify how to introduce self-testing for HIV. Without our advocacy work, the state would still not have any of these strategies implemented in a regular and general manner. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Pasquin ogun -Soya. I work with Alive Medical Services as the Executive Director. It's a great honor for me to be on this panel. Let me give you a brief background of Alive Medical Services. Alive Medical Services is a not-for-profit, non-governmental organization that was founded in 2007 and is located in Namwongo, Kampala, Uganda. Alive Medical Services is the in-country coordinating partner of Frontline AIDS and coordinating four implementing partners of the Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights Umbrella Program. This program is aimed at expanding access to quality, inclusive, integrated, sexual reproductive health and rights, HIV and tuberculosis services to vulnerable and marginalized communities in 13 districts in Uganda. AMS has received awards for outstanding TB case finding in Kampala, and all our programs integrate lung health 
and TB services. Today, I'm delighted to share with you our successful advocacy campaign in Mukono District, one of our districts of implementation of the SRHR umbrella program. So when we began implementation in 2018, we noted key issues that needed advocacy. Number one was low budget allocation to family planning commodities, which led to frequent stockouts. There was no meaningful involvement of young people in key decision making spaces. Young people representation on health unit management committees was less than 1%. And also only few health facilities were offering youth friendly services. So what are the advocacy activities we did? So we partnered with 13 other like-minded civil societies and community-based organizations in the district to form a consortium for joint advocacy activities. And um, next slide. We utilize the advocacy and communication strategy developed by the SRHR umbrella in 2019. We also use the Mukono District Health Plan for Adolescent Health. We engage sub-county and district leaders to implement 2019 Ministry of Health guidelines on composition of humix. And uh, what were the key achievements? In the financial year 2019-2020, there was a 15% increase in budget allocation to family planning in the district. This was maintained in 2020-2021 financial year despite the challenges of COVID-19. More interestingly is that in the current financial year, the budget allocation increased by 18.5% from the 2019-2020 ceiling. Other achievements included 10 young advocates have been empowered to take lead in developing and presenting advocacy asks to technical working groups like budget committees and district councils. There was also an increase in the young people representation on the health unit management committees to 63% and 45 health workers have been adequately trained in provision of adolescent youth and youth friendly services. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to this session on successful advocacy campaigns and lesson learned and also some best practices. Uh, my name is Blessina Kumar, and I have no conflict of interest to report. I'm with the Global Coalition of TB Advocates. And in this session, I will be bringing to you our experience of ground level realities uh, informing uh, global policy change. Through our um, experience in building capacity of uh, communities, TB affected communities, we repeatedly heard over and over again that stigma was a huge barrier to accessing care and treatment. And this was in fact hindering um, people affected by TB in getting better and in getting the treatment. So we started gathering the evidence and we spoke to many people across the globe and we came up with three booklets that actually document the stories of people who were affected by TB and the stigma and discrimination that they went through. The books were on women, children, and men. The TB Stigma and Women book was uh, launched at the 2018 high-level meeting. And this got a lot of uh, response from people across the globe. People were interested. Uh, it was a new, um, even though stigma was known, but these stories really made the reality of stigma very much alive and real in people's uh, thinking. So we developed a stigma fact sheet along with 
uh, partners in India to inform people about what tuberculosis and stigma was and how it plays out. And some of the testimonials from people were shared through that document. Along with partners globally, we continue to advocate for stigma to be addressed at the highest level for policy change. Based on these stories, we brought it to the highest level and we, along with the global community, we held donors, policymakers, and implementers accountable. And this advocacy translated into addressing stigma becoming one of the top 10 recommendations of the UNSG report of 2020. Now, once this policy change had happened at the highest level, it was time to take it down to the ground level in the countries to roll this out and make it a reality for people affected by TB. I'd like to cite the example of India. We worked with partners uh, and the NTP, National TB Programme, Ministry of Health, Government of India. And along with partners, we developed the national strategy on ending TB stigma and discrimination. And this was launched by the health minister on World TB Day in 2021. So we had the highest endorsement from the country, uh, from the leaders, and almost all the work on stigma is being based on this in the country right now. And presently, we're working on operationalizing this document along uh, with other partners for the National TV program. We are developing a training manual for training National TV program workers and other partners, and also to develop indicators. So this has really come a full circle from gathering evidence to actually documenting that to having the highest level endorsement, taking it back to the country level so that it becomes a strategy at the country level and all partners can use it and be informed about some of the strategies that are there to address stigma at the ground level. So for the Global Coalition of TB Advocates, this is really a best practice example and uh, we are proud to say that the advocacy around stigma has been successful and brought about a lot of changes. And hopefully this will make a big difference in the lives of people because communities are the core. Communities bring the ground realities and the lived experiences to the table. Communities advocate based on lived experiences. Community voices are extremely powerful. Communities also ensure that people-centered approaches become a reality and that the human rights are upheld. And most importantly, communities give a human face to TB because in the global TB response, it is very easy to forget that there are people at the end of that line that we are talking about. And communities can make that difference and make it all about people and people-centered. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to be part of the Global Coalition of TB Advocates, the details are here. Please do get in touch. We'd love to have you as part of our global family. Thank you. My name is Peter Witte, the Executive Director of World Youth Development Project in Makweni, Kenya. Today, we want to talk about combining efforts and joint advocacy activities between civil society, various government bodies, and that is the executive government, parliamentarians, and the local authorities. One of such activities is the TB Parliamentary Caucus. The Global TB Caucus is a unique global network of parliamentarians united by their shared commitment to end TB epidemic. In Kenya, parliament is a very uh, powerful uh, instrument for 
making legislation, and also approving the budgets. The budgets uh, that are approved in parliament uh, can help to accelerate uh, uh, policy changes and also uh, the funding of those particular uh, budgetary lines. The civil society parliamentary uh, combined forces with the parliamentarians. And the process of recruiting the parliamentary was that at all the civil societies in the 47 counties in Kenya came together and we get targeted parliamentarians that are friendly to health issues. And at the same time, we also uh, uh, targeted the uh, health committees in parliament. This became our entry point where we formed the parliamentary caucus so that they can be able to push our agenda. These parliamentarians were briefed mm -hmm. on the issue of TB and how it affects their communities and why it's important for TB funding allocation and also the issue of TB to be raised in parliament, not only within the country, but also with other parliamentarians at, uh, in, in the developed countries. This brought together the Global Parliamentarians Caucus that meet very often to help us in uh, fighting the war against TB. And particularly, they are more important in pushing their governments uh, during the replen replenishment, uh, global fund replenishment, which I will talk about later. The second way that the, uh, we combined efforts with parliamentarians and uh, various government bodies is through the global fund replenishment. Sub-Saharan Africa countries receive 72% of the global funds and have two constituencies. The first constituency is uh, between the is West and Central Africa, and the con second constituency is the Southern Africa known as the ESA. Civil societies held a series of meetings uh, the, uh, that uh, and organized, uh, 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 organized under the auspices of the Friends of Global Fund at country level and also at, uh, at the global level. And here is where uh, 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 Malawi was chosen as the lead country in the uh, uh, replenishment uh, for the African regions. Uh, in my own country, uh, uh, as a part of the milestones that we assembled around table and called all the parliamentarians, including the embassies to uh, around table, uh, we had the minister uh, for health, as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, Principal Secretary for Health, they came together and we sat around a land table and talked to them about the need to increase the replenishment by 30% as has been uh, uh, put on target by the African Union. Uh, the idea was that we wanted uh, their participation so that uh, they help us not only to push for the replenishment agenda, but also to make sure that this uh, replenishment uh, 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 are also honored uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so the civil society was very instrumental as friends of Global Fund to push for this agenda and to make it a success uh, during the uh, replenishment at the, uh, in New York uh, uh, later this year. Uh, the third, uh, a combined effort I would like to mention is the 33% campaign. Global Fund Against TBS and Malaria is the largest funding mechanism in Kenya to fight the above diseases. TB has been getting the smallest allocation of the funding uh, due to uh, the voice of the civil society and the voice of the parliamentarians not being loud enough to, to be heard, particularly for the, the 
the sea split uh, during the location. So TB uh, only gets 18% uh, of the three diseases. And this has made investment in TB to be uh, not being effective in ending TB uh, as we as was planned in the global plan to be uh, to end by uh, by 2030. Uh, of, so this consolidated offer of the 33 percent was again one of the, uh, the 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 milestones that were created by the civil society to explain to the parliamentarians and to explain to the uh, local government the need to increase the funding with TB uh, uh, from uh, their location and also uh, to end a pandemic that has been there for over uh, uh, 300 years, uh, over 100 years, sorry. In order to change the civil society, they therefore started this 33% uh, campaign to using the power of the parliament to allocate money. And in Kenya, uh, the government, man, uh, through the parliamentarian, managed to allocate uh, five uh, uh, billion Kenya shillings to uh, TB, HIV, and malaria, uh, so that uh, the um, uh, TB uh, could have an enhanced allocation for the diseases. Uh, these three approaches, we find it to be very useful and we are still looking at more ways where we can have a joint voice between the parliamentarians and the civil society in uh, having activities that bring us together, activities that uh, uh, help us to voice the actual situation on the ground and, and also to push the health agenda that can help save life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all presenters for wonderful experience and, and sharing. So maybe I would like to ask all our uh, panelists to kind of have their uh, video and video open at least so that we can all see each other. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think maybe before we go along, I mean, have some discussion among ourselves, I just see one question, maybe we can just get Get you know, get on with that question first, and then maybe we can uh, we can have some more discussion. So there is a question is about is there any preparation each of us doing in our own country in regards to UNHLM, which is coming next year. So is there any agenda you'd like to push forward to US UNHLM, and and will your how is your organization participating in UNHLM? Something like that. So maybe we could take uh, Christian if you do you want to go on first yes sorry for that question I just don't have answer it yet we are not making any preparation right now okay no problem maybe uh, blessy maybe you you would be able to share some. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question. I think it's a very important question. And uh, uh, we, we uh, don't have much time, so we have to start preparing. Um, uh, so uh, some of the things that we need to do as a global community is actually uh, decide on what the civil society and communities asks are going to be. What are our priorities? And for this, we really need the global community to come together. So that is at the global level. Then at the country level, uh, it would be important to be in touch with our own uh, ministries of health, uh, find out who from the government is being nominated to attend this and who is part of the country delegation. We are in that process right now in India. And uh, uh, it will be very important to see if some of the civil society members can actually be on that delegation. So that is uh, something, number two, that we should, uh, we should be doing. 
Then number three, it would be important to have um, in-country uh, uh, dialogues, you know, bringing people together, first of all, uh, to, so that it is un in uh, you know, it is inclusive. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind. So even though we know that all of us can't be there, but at least our perspectives, our um, uh, needs, our uh, priorities can be voiced, can be taken to that uh, uh, high level meeting and that the outcomes of that, the decisions that are make, made at that reflect the needs on the ground. So we have to be working at different levels. So at the country level, at the regional level to have these uh, regional consultations, and of course, at the global level. But I just want to say that it is not just one organization or a group of people. It will need all of us to actually come together as one TB community if we want to have that critical mass that will inform and that will really shake the world uh, towards ending TB uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I think this is this is exactly where I think you know we, if we want to do something by ourselves, you know, in the old saying, you know, you can't. Together, you are stronger. So I think in country level, that's where it comes to comes down to. Some civil society organizations do not have, you know, sufficient level of influence or maybe connection, if you will, with the policymakers. And that's where, you know, you know, sometimes few organizations who has that kind of connection, maybe if they're not consulting with other civil society organizations in the country, then messages doesn't get formed. So the idea is here, I think the more we can actually go horizontally to all the NGOs, all the civil society affected people, get their views on what is important from the country perspective, community perspective, and that message, if we can pass to uh, our policymaker leaders to take that commitment to the UN, I think that would be really great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Paskin, do you want to add, please? I actually, thank you very much, Bresina and Zahed. I actually really agree with you. In Uganda, the problem of TB is still very big. Yesterday and today we ended the national symposium on HIV and AIDS and the figure is alarming. So it's when we are all together really that we can fight TB. TB is still a big problem. Uh, in our countries. So I agree with both Blessina and Zahed that it's partnership and not leaving anyone behind that will help us fight this disease. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I just want to kind of have a little discussion among ourselves in terms of, you know, this uh, kind of national increase of national funding number one, you know, how we can in advocate to increase national funding. I think there has been example, Pas uh, Paskin given an example, and also maybe Christian, and Peter's example is also very good. I mean, it's a global advocacy. At the end of the day, it was coming towards Kenyan government actually increasing funding, which also have an effect of global fund money coming into the country. So I think this is really very important, and I find it really you know, vital at the time of when the funding for TB is really, really scarce. And of course, there are donors who is going to give money, but how can we push government to also commit themselves to at least contribute to the fighting of TB? Even take COVID-19. When COVID came, all the TB money was reallocated to, uh, you know, uh, from TB to COVID and everything else. So, I mean, I... I understand there was some uh, uh, effort made by uh, well, uh, what Paskin's example. It was really, uh, 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 you know, great to see. But what would be something, you know, more coherent approach on these kind of things that we can we can apply? I mean, many countries maybe face the same problem. Is there anything that we can say, oh, this, you know, for example, something we can apply, some tools or some methodology we can apply to engage ministries of finance, for example, in each of the countries or something. I mean, I know that every country is different, 
there is no magic bullet, but I mean, just a thinking thought, maybe bless you if you want to kind of reflect on it a little bit. Can I go? Yeah, uh, yeah please. From, uh, thank you, Zahid. Oh, okay. We, we, our organization is on the National uh, HIV Prevention Committee that meets with different community groups. And then we kind of uh, bring our heads together. And for example, the prevention roadmap, roadmap, and then, you know, domesticate it and make it something that government can take over and also support. So if we could apply such a thing also on TB, TB prevention, make sure that communities come together and then have a full force to present to government to present asks, to advocate for more resources, I think it will work. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Yes, thank you. I think uh, uh, in TB we have, uh, uh, one of the problems is that we tend to work in silos. Mm -hmm. I think we need, uh, Zahid, you alluded to this earlier about multi-sectoral um, accountability uh, framework. Not just accountability, I think we need to start thinking about multi-sectoral um, uh, you know, approach to yeah. addressing TB. Because it isn't just the TB program or the Ministry of Health. We need the Ministry of Economics. We need the uh, Ministry of um, Social Justice. We need the Ministry of Housing. Uh, we need ministry that's looking after the nutrition and, and uh, um, uh, you know, public systems. So I think uh, we need to learn to work through all that and, and actually keep raising TB as not just a medical problem, but as a social issue, a public health issue that everybody needs to be um, concerned about. That is one thing. The second thing is... Uh, what is the GDP in our own countries? What is the health expenditure? You know, I know India is very low and we have been pushing as uh, part of the India um, uh, advocacy groups, uh, India Working Group on Health Advocacy. We, we are constantly pushing. We work on TB, HIV and malaria. And one of the things we have been advocating with our political leadership is that we need increased investment into uh, GDP for health specifically. We want it to be raised. We want more investment to go into that. And thirdly, we, none of this will happen if we at the ground level do not create that uh, demand, do not create the urgency that is needed. So we need to work at these levels. I feel like not just horizontal, even vertical, we need to have connections and all those need to be connected horizontally at these levels. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Christian, do you want to add anything? Yes, um, actually what Lucina said is really important. I think also we have to realize that um, now with COVID pandemic and the World Health Organization uh, trying to make this uh, pandemic treaty and now with the pandemic fund, we really have to work in our local levels to tell our governments the importance of the community response in all the pandemics. TB is an example, HIV and malaria are also. Our community services are really in the front line. So we really need to work with them to realize that these new things that are going in the, in the world tables, we have to be engaged. The community have to need to have voice. And in that way, we will found another ways to have other budgets and new way to to uh, keep the fighting with tv and other pandemics 
Thank you. So I just want to add maybe a little more on this. You know, now the global uh, sort of health architecture was there are many new initiatives, like, you know, the pandemic preparedness. And then, you know, there was a COVID-19. There are a lot of fundings available for health system strengthening. And for COVID purpose, community systems strengthening was one of the key. And without community, COVID was wherever we are at the moment, maybe we wouldn't be coming here. Community was the linkage between the healthcare provider and the healthcare, health, I mean, the receiver of those services. So, but every time community gets, uh, uh, you know, neglected and we are at the lowest priority level. So I think here community needs to be a little bit more, perhaps it falls in on us to be more, you know, knowledgeable on what is happening at the global level so that we can advocate, take that message and ask for questions in our country level so that we, with that knowledge, we can do that. And that comes to funding. And there are many different opportunities that the co communities and civil society at the country level have no knowledge of. If they would know about it, they would be able to you know, talk about it, advocate it, and uh, get access to it. So that is something I think also uh, maybe we can kind of think about in our own, own uh, context. So second discussion, next discussion I want to have about, let's see, your uh, wonderful tool that you, uh, you know, the storytelling as well as the stigma uh, 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 trainings and all of those things are, uh, framework has been developed. I mean, how this tool and, and, and this wealth of knowledge that can be widely shared, I mean, I know that you are willing to, you know, support anybody who would be coming, but, you know, is there sort of a way that others can connect to it and then get the information. And also people would need to maybe have some kind of methodology to start training and this and that. So what, what is your thought, how you, you know, can help and support on this? Yeah, thank you, uh, Zahid, for that uh, um, uh, question. And uh, actually the books are stories of people from every region, um, of South America, North America, um, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, uh, Francophone Africa, Anglophone Africa, of survivors from all these regions. So it's actually something that is really global, the stories. So it has to be owned by all of us. Yes, we, we facilitated it, but it is not ours. It, it belongs to all of us, number one. The second thing is that uh, whatever we have developed uh, is on our website, and we are always trying to translate them. Um, our human rights uh, tools are translated even into Russian, Arabic, um, uh, Spanish, um, uh, French, English. So, you know, we want to make it available for as many people as possible. Now, with the uh, strategy, the National Strategic Plan for Ending TB uh, that has been developed by India, we are very happy to help other uh, colleagues, communities, civil society to do this in your own countries. We are always available. But then again, the funding is the issue, which we all know when it comes to communities and civil society, there is very little that is available. But we have to make the best of what we have. So we are available uh, to support. And if you want to use the tool, if you want to translate it, it is freely av available, open access. We do not put uh, uh, you know, limit to who can use it. It is all there because we in GCTA believe we are all in this together and we need to work together. It, TB response doesn't belong to a small group. It belongs to all of us. And it is our collective dream to make sure that we see the end to TB in the near future. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think it is important that, you know, the stories are coming from all across the globe. And if any country wants to portray a story from their own country, maybe they can find something relative in this package. So that would be also very helpful to amplify the message in their own context. I think that's excellent. So, I mean, we are almost towards the end of our session. We have like 15 seconds left. So I would maybe ask if 
any of our uh, 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 panel has any last word to say uh, just uh, before maybe oh okay yeah that's that's uh, good to see the that's good to see I saw your email yeah uh, and uh, the website yeah yeah Okay, anybody has any anything else to say? Otherwise, maybe we could, uh, you know, thank. Just, I'm going to pause if anybody has any last word to say. Uh, Christian or Pasquin? I think I just want to say that TB and lung disease is still a big problem. And like Blessina said, it really needs a multi-sectoral approach and it needs everyone. And also like uh, Christiana talked about communities. Communities have some experience, but they need to learn what is happening at the big table, but also the people, um, the development partners and those that have resources should be able to respect communities and have meaningful engagements with communities. Thank you. Well, thank you then, everyone. I think I'm just a little bit sad that we have uh, one of our fellow panelists, Peter, couldn't join because he he seemed ill, but we wish him uh, all the best to get well. So thank you very much, uh, friends, uh, for a very nice discussion. At the very end of the day, I'm sure everybody's tired. So uh, let's call it a day. And thank you for your uh, participation and presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think Thank, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.